we do thank you for this day, another time and opportunity to be in your house and just take time out of our week to slow down and just concentrate on you. And we just ask that you would speak to our hearts tonight, give us exactly what we need to hear, be with all those who couldn't make it out tonight, whether sickness or other things. Lord, just bring them back, and we just ask your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. 270, a song that has uh, probably a special place in many of our hearts, newer song, but one that has... Uh, great truth and uh, something we probably more than one time in our life cried out at the top of our lungs, whether verbally or not. Lord, I need you. Two, seven, zero. Sometimes the Christ seems gentle. here tonight. Here's your chance to share what the Lord has been Where did you see the Lord at work? Yeah, you might as well get me out of the way up <laughs> I probably had the fastest answer to a prayer the other day I believe I've ever had. It was just a matter of seconds. And I had bought something for a dear friend down in Missouri. I wanted to get it, get it mailed to him, but I couldn't find it. And I was starting to worry about it. I said, Lord, and I had done this in the past. In fact, I learned it from you. Lord, I need that. You know, would you please... Please show me where it's at. Reveal it to me, Father, so I can have that to sin. I had just finished the amen. I hear her calling from the bedroom. Oh, here it is. <laughs> God is so good. So good. Yep. 
We waste a lot of times looking for things. Well, if we did, we'd put our trust in the Lord. He. The the Lord just seems to answer so many prayers every day. It hard it'd be a hard thing to say all of it in one you know, one time. But um when Bob passed away we just knew for a year we weren't going to make any huge decisions or do anything. And so November came, and I started praying about what the Lord wanted me to do um, with the farm and everything, not, not knowing what he would want, just like, Lord, not my will, your will. And so um, just drove by this equipment company the other day. I have a big, huge farm, International 656. I can't use it. I'm afraid to get on it. Even if I did, I didn't even know how to drive it. It's just sitting in my yard. And so I thought, boy, let me see if I can take this to an auction and see what I can get and maybe put a premium on it and be done with it. And um, so I keep driving by this one place, and there's a smaller type bobcat um, type thing that I could run and move ground and stuff I need to do with. And I'm like, Lord, just... I don't, I don't even know how to pray about this right now. So I just drove in to the place, and there was a picture of on, on the wall of a um, Farmall International. I said, I love that picture. I have one in my home. I, I can't use it. I, I'm really, you know, I don't know what to do. He said, well, um, I said, I think I'm going to just take it to an auction and take my chances on it. He goes, no, let me come out, get the VIN number. Let me you know, see what it's worth for you. And I might even be able to trade you in for something you want here. So not like the trade-in is perfect, but with just several things, you know, that have happened, I'm like, okay. And I've um, some friends of ours are in town this uh, week, and uh, they've given me some advice on it. And then Bob's best friend called me out of the blue today on the way to church and gave me more advice on it. But just seeing the Lord work and move, um, just specifically this week on things that I've literally been praying for for over a year and just seeing the Lord work um, and giving us clear answers, not what if this, what if that, but just finalized clear answers. So Good. I praise the Lord for that. Good. Where do you see the Lord at work? Or did you see the Lord at work? Many times in my life, the story, and it's one of my favorites, the of um, Jesus being in the boat with the disciples and there being the storm. And 
Um, as a worrier, to be honest with you, like reading that story every other time in my life, to be honest, a thought I've always had is, well, how rude. Like, <laughs> I totally understand why the disciples were upset. Um, and without realizing it, I was, I think, taught growing up that if someone is not wringing their hands and stressing out and beside themselves, it's because they don't care. So I've always had a hard time interpreting um, when someone isn't showing those signs. To me, it's always been they don't care because they're not like that. And so when, all, when I would always read that story, I would always, that's how it would always come across to me, just like it did the disciples. Well, how rude. You're just sleeping. And, and so that's how people, how it's always seemed to me, that when someone is not stressing out beside themselves, fretting, worrying, it's because they don't care. And it was just, the Lord just showed me for the first, you know, it, it was a new way for me to think about it in that Jesus wasn't acting like that because, like, he knew. He knew he was going to calm the storm. And it, that's why he asked the disciples, like, where's your faith? If they had had the faith, then they wouldn't have been acting like that. And so it just, it was a new way for me to see it. And it was another step in my journey of the Lord teaching me um, how to not be a worrier, how to trust and have faith. Don't want to cut you off here tonight. Going once. Going twice. All right, thank you so much for sharing your blessings. You don't need more blessings. You need to see what God's already at work doing. He is an amazing God doing amazing things. We're in the book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. We finished our study in Colossians two weeks ago, and it just seemed like the natural thing to do was just turn the page one more page and go right into Thessalonians. And so we started last week there, and we started by memorizing verse number two. It was a little short. That was easy. Uh, tonight we're going to memorize verse number three. So when you get to First Thessalonians... I'll read verse number three to you here. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. All right, so there's the verse we're going to memorize. So read it with me. We'll read it through a couple of times here. Read it with me. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse number one. Remembering without ceasing. Hello, let's go. <laughs> Are you in 1 Thessalonians? Let's try this here. Did I say 3-1? You know what I meant, didn't you? <laughs> Can't you read my mind? <laughs> We've been at this a long time, you know. <laughs> oh, your mind does funny things, and your mouth doesn't catch it. All right, here we go. Verse number three of chapter number one. Everybody with me now? Make a little more sense? Sorry about that. A little detour. Here we go. Remembering is our first word. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. All right, very good. Let's try it again. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. One more time. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Now as we read it, try to envision what it's actually saying. You've got the words running now. Now try to envision in your mind, what is this saying? Here we go. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. All right, let's see. I think you can kind of 
let go and walk out here a little one step without looking. Let's try it. If you can, one eye on it if you have to, one eye on it, both eyes off, whatever you can do here. Here we go. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Okay, that was good. Let's try it one more time here. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Now try to think about what you ate for breakfast this morning. That's a long ways back. Let's try it again here. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Okay, now we're going to really try it. We're going to go back to verse number 2 and see if we, let's read through 2 and 3 and then we'll quote them. All right, so read verse number 2 and 3 together with me. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Okay, now here we go, all together with it. Try to keep your eye off the page if you can. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Good. We're making progress there. That's a good start for this memorizing this chapter. Last week, if you remember, we started this. We ended our two weeks ago, Colossians, we started and we get it kind of gave an overview of how the church at Thessalonica got started. The book of Acts tells us that. And if you remember, Paul went to Thessalonica and what he always did is he went right to the synagogue and he started teaching there. And he would show them for the, from the Word of God how Christ was, had to die and that Jesus was the Christ. And he would show them from the Scriptures. And so he did that for three weeks at Thessalonica in a row. He went there three weeks and did that. And the, the Jews there at Thessalonica weren't really that interested. They were not interested in digging into the scriptures and finding out the truth of this matter. And so they just kind of let it go. But some of the Jews did see the reality of it and trusted Christ as their Savior. But the Greeks around them, lots of them got saved. And so this little church forms here of all these Greeks and some of the Jews, a church forms. And we don't know how long Paul was there, but he was there long enough for the church at Philippi to send him two different, or Colossians, I can't remember which church, sent him two different uh, amounts of money to keep him going. And so he was there for probably several months at least. And the, Jew, the church was growing and stabilizing. And the Jews from the synagogue got a little irritated with that, a little jealous. So they stirred up a riot. And Paul had to get, they had to sneak Paul out of town. And Timothy and Silas went with him. He went to Berea which is a town close by, and did the same thing. Only there, the Jews heard what Paul had to say. They got into the scriptures and said, this is the truth. And so a whole bunch of Jews got saved at Berea and some, uh, some Gentiles, the Greeks. Well, the, Jew, the member of the Jews from Thessalonica heard that this church was taking place in Berea, and so they sent the rioters over there and sent, got Paul kicked out of there. They sent him by ship. Eventually, he asked Timothy and Silas to come with him, to, to join him there. But somewhere along the line, we're not quite sure when, Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica to see how the church is going. Now, think about the church. It's not very old. Months old, but Timothy goes back, and he comes back and reports to Paul with a very good report. And Thessalonians, the book we're reading here, is Paul's response to that. After he's heard from Timothy how things are going, he hasn't been back since, and he's heard, heard how things are going, and this is his letter to those people. So that's where we're at. Um, and so let's read the first chapter here tonight. Again, we read it last week to kind of get our 
the connotation of this, Paul's introduction here to this church that he helped start but wasn't there very long. So read it with me if you would please. We'll start in verse number 1. We'll read the whole chapter for 10 verses here. Here we go. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received of the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Good. All righty, let's pray. And then we'll see what the Lord will teach us. We'll cover a couple, three verses here tonight. Lord, we bless your name. We are so thankful to be here. We thank you for the opportunity to sit in a nice facility, to gather as your children, to review some of the blessings that you poured into our lives, to have a copy of your word, and to be able to memorize it and hide it in our heart for future use. And now to open it and study from it and let your spirit teach us is grace beyond words. And we ask, Lord, that you would, by your spirit, teach us truth. We're not looking to just have our knowledge increased, Father, but to, that your spirit would put the words so deeply that we might live them as our Savior did. For we ask this in his precious and holy name. Amen. Verse number two is where we are at. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. It struck me as I read this, Paul wasn't there very long, but human beings have a strange capacity for bonding with each other. Have you noticed that? In the animal kingdom, there are some animals that have absolutely no relationship with their other animals. Then you have some who have actually, they... They mate for life, and so you have these partners. And then some you have uh, that band into herds because, for mutual protection and for um, mutual help. They call those clans or herds. Um, and so we have that in the animal world. Human beings are capable of forming not only bonds of marriage and of family, and bonds for protection and that kind of thing and help, mutual benefit. But human beings are capable of forming deep relationships that are mutually beneficial, but they're not based in mutual benefit. They're based in friendship. Now that may be a little confusing. It's not unusual, let's put it this way. It's not unusual for a family to go on vacation. And while you're on vacation, you meet somebody that you never know, and they're from a different state. And you, in, you meet them, and you enjoy them, and the next thing you know, you're friends. And you're good friends for decades after that. This is one of those things that human beings are capable of, of forming mutual friendships based in just friendship, not the benefit that you get from each other, just friendship. How much more, if the average person in the world is able to do that, how much more are Christians able to do that? When you meet someone and you have the bond of the Spirit, 
this puts us on a whole nother level. And so here we have Paul, who's not been back to Thessalonica since the riot happened. He is, these people are still on his mind. He's remembering them regularly. And he does what is the best thing possible that can be done for anybody. What is he doing for them? He is praying for them. Now, the word making mention here means to remember. So Paul is remembering them in his prayers. He is praying for them continually. He's bringing them before the throne. Now, I think I, well, I've told you several times I, I've been enjoying over the last maybe year or so listening to attorney David Gibbs uh, speak. He's, it's, uh, you can get his messages on uh, sermon audio. He, do you, know, you know him, Tim, right? Don't you? You're kind of linked with the Christian, Christian Law Association. He's the head of that. And so, anyway, he speaks around the country in churches. And so he preaches quite a bit on prayer, actually. And I've enjoyed listening to some of his messages on prayer. And uh, he's mentioned this illustration, and I'll, I'll take his thought. It's not his illustration, but I'll take part of it because it's his thought here uh, that I think is interesting. We all know about Aladdin's magic lamp. When you rub it, you get what? A genie, a a genie and gets you three wishes, okay? So with that thought process, okay, he says, wouldn't it be great... If in the Bible, every Christian was guaranteed ten miracle asks. You get into trouble, you get over your head, you get into a real bad situation, and you have ten miracle asks. Use, use them wisely, make sure that this is important, and okay, because you've got ten of them. Wouldn't that be great? Okay, I'm in a jam here, and I've got a miracle asking, so I'm, I'm going. You, you got that in your mind? I need, to, you got ten miracle asks. That would be wonderful. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say you get ten miracle asks. How many miracle asks do you get? Unlimited. Isn't that a mind-boggling thought? Did you know that you can go to God and ask for a miracle, a dozen miracles a day? You can go to God and ask for as many miracles as you need. You can go to God for your friends and your relatives and your, all, the, all the difficulties and work and all that. You can ask for literal miracles as many times a day as you need. You are not limited you're not going to get to the, oh, you've reached your maximum. Sorry, we can't help you anymore here. You've asked for too much. You cannot get to that level. You have the right to ask for as many miracles as are needed. The problem is we so rarely ask. We see the problem. We know this is going to take a miracle, but... It's like we have to hoard them. Well, I only have 10 here. I'm going to keep mine. This may not be big enough. You're not limited. And we have not because we ask not. And Paul says, I'm bringing you. I remember you. We didn't have a long time together, just a couple of months. But I remember you, and I am bringing you before the Lord every day. It's the best thing you can do for your friends and for your family is to bring them to the Lord. Ask for miracles. God is in the habit and in the practice of doing miracles. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Number three, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. And there is a lot that we could cover in this verse there are so many ways we could go, but to, we have to keep a reasonable pace. We're just going to catch the highlights. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at this verse and find the three main words in it. They're not big words, but the three main words. They're really the makeup. These three words make up our side of the Christian life.
How many have the three words? Most everybody has three words, but if you raise your hand, you're afraid I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Shannon wants me to call on her. Is that what you said, Pastor Sean? <laughs> what are the three words? Faith and hope. Okay, now, where do we also find those other three words? In, in one verse. Now, I'm hearing the, I'm hearing the, somebody be bold. 1 Corinthians 13. Now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. And, and the greatest of these is charity. Good. So, it's interesting that those three are right there in this verse. So, these are young believers. The church isn't a 50-year-old church. These aren't Christians who've been saved for 100 years. You know, this isn't a church that's been around for a long time. It's been established recently. It's years old at best. And what do they have in the church? This is something to think about. What does Paul uh, Remembering about them, that they have faith, hope, and charity, love. Now, wait a second. These Christians are only, they just come out of idolatry. They're only a couple of years old. These are what we would consider baby Christians. Now, if they were there after a couple of years, where should we be? If we've been saved for 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, where should we be if these Christians are this young and have these things enough that Paul's remembering them? We ought to be a long ways down the road from there. Something to think about. Their faith, hope, and love were worth remembering and thanking God for. So let's work through these. Number one is the work of faith. The work of faith. Now remember a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night, uh, we t discussed John chapter number 6, verse number 29, and that verse says, we would do the works of God, and the work of God is to believe on him whom he has sent. That is the work that we have to do. The work of God is to believe, the work of faith, the work to believe. We are told to fight the good fight of faith. Faith is not passive, as in it's just going to wait and see how things turn out. That is not faith, to wait and see how things are going to turn out. Faith is active. Now, by that, I don't mean that faith runs out and does a whole bunch of things. What I mean by that is faith sees what God has said in his word and then lives and acts like that is the way that it is. It counts it as that's the way that it is. Faith is active. It doesn't wait and see. It says that's the way it is. It doesn't wait to see if it's true. It lives, it makes decisions based on the fact that this is the way that it is. It's what God said. That's what faith is. It's active. Passive faith is easy. Path passive faith just sits around to see if it's going to turn out the way that you were hoping it would. And then if it turns out that way, then you believe it. That is not actually faith. What is that? <laughs> That's sight. If you can see that it turned out that way, and you wait till the end, that's not faith, that is sight. Real faith is real work, and it accomplishes real results. It is a fight of faith. It is the work that we're called to do, and if you've not tried it, you'll realize that this takes some effort here to believe, because our tendency is to doubt, and it's... Faith is active, and it was something that you really have to concentrate on. I believe I'm going to step out and act like this is what it is because that's the way God said it. And just so you know, true, honest, real faith will not be idle. It will cause you to work. It will cause you to do things and be active, but you'll come at it from a totally different standpoint when you're actually in faith. It won't just be sitting around. So we have the work of faith. Then we have the labor of love. The labor of love. I was trying to do some interesting calculations here. So calculate with me in your mind. 
if this church decided to hire everything done that's done here on this property, if they decided to hire it all done, how much would that cost? If we hired professional teachers to teach Sunday school, if we hired a professional pianist and a professional organist and a professional song people and professional choir, professional specials and all that, if we hired professional sound people and professional video people, if we hired the treasurer and the accountant, if we hired the deacon board, on and on and on, okay? And every single piece of work that was done on the property was hired done by professionals. What would that cost? We have the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, my mind, I, I, it's like, wow, this would be big business. If you had to hire all of this done, I, I don't, I can tell you right now, we couldn't afford it. We could not afford it. But let's just say we could. Let's just say that some anonymous donor decides that he's willing to foot the bill, whatever the payroll is, and he'll pay it. We can hire the best of the best professionals, and he'll pay the bill. So our payroll is not an issue. Okay, and so we hire it all done. Let me ask you a simple question. How long will you attend this church? You say, I'm not going to go there. Even though we had the most professional Sunday school teachers we could get, we had the most professional musicians, the most professional everything, we would all actually walk out the door. What if they hired a pastor? <laughs> that is the best idea I've heard all night. <laughs> I know how we can make a quick vacancy where we can put one in here. <laughs> And I would not oppose that. All those in favor? <laughs> I've often thought this church would be doing well with a professional pastor. <laughs> Some of you actually knew what he was doing. <laughs> Think about it. Why is that? Why would we all walk out and say, I'm not going to church there? Because... The work that's done here is a labor of love, and that makes a difference. If the Sunday school sta teacher stands up, and it's because they're that's because they get paid to do it, and the treasurer does it because he's paid to do it, and the deacon board makes the decision because that's because they're paid to do that, you'd say, "Sorry, I'm not interested." It's a labor of love, a love for Jesus Christ, and a love for the brethren, and so. Even if we don't have the best musicians or the best deacons or the best, the best, the best, the best, all of that. It is the best because it's a labor of love. And the Lord works through that avenue. And so Paul is saying, you people have a labor of love. All of our labor here. And we, there's a lot of work that goes on here. I just, it boggles the mind as you watch what everybody's doing. And all. if you don't, you don't have the seat that I have. But I watch and say, wow, there's a lot of man hours being put in here. Whatever man hours you put in, make sure that, one, it starts from a labor of love for Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of everything that you do here is a love for Jesus Christ. And also, it is a love for one another. It is a labor of love for for the brethren. When we have that, that is much, 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 that's a church worth attending, by the way. So make sure that everything that you do is from, it is actually a labor of love. Number three is patience in hope. And by the way, what 1 Corinthians says, if you don't have that labor of love, what do you have? Sounding brass, tinkling cymbal, it profits you nothing. That's why you wouldn't attend here. It's, you got nothing. If you, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. Patience of hope. Now, hope in the world is, is uh, wishful thinking, or I looked up the definition, it means this. A desire for a certain thing to happen with expectations that it might. Okay, that's a pretty decent definition of hope. 
a desire for a certain thing to happen with an expectation that it might. Now, that is not biblical hope. Biblical hope is confident expectations. The might is taken out of it. Okay, this is the way it is. This is what I expect to happen. That's hope. The Christian life is made up of a lot of areas of hope. See if we can get a hold of this. What is the opposite of hope? Now, there's two, there's two sides of this. What is the opposite of hope? Despair. Okay. One side is if you have sight, the item is here. The thing is here. You don't have to have hope because you have it. Okay. The other side is no hope, which is despair. So, we have sight and we have despair. The Christian life is never one, should never be one of despair, correct? Because that is to say we have no hope, there's no chance. That was to, to deny God's ability. So we should never have a life of despair. Let me ask you this. How much of the Christian life is sight? It's a good question, isn't it? Well, the reality is there is sight, but not much at a time. Most of the things we do, we're walking by faith, not sight. Most of the things we do, we have confident expectations, but we don't have sight to say this is, this is happening. When we pray, we pray with confident expectation, but often you pray for quite a while without any sight at all. There's several of us have been praying for some specific things. Nigh on to uh, maybe 10 months now, we've been praying for this specific thing. For the first four months or five months, if you would have been a betting man, you would have bet against us. Because if you were calculating and charting the things, it looked like it was going the wrong way. Have you ever had your prayers go that, like that? I'm praying for this end, and it looks like it's going that direction. So what do you do? Well, you could go into despair, which is the opposite of hope. You don't have any sight, but you can have confident expectation that that's not how this is going to end up. I am going to keep praying and watch God work. I expect him to work. After about five months... Things started to take a turn, and now we're standing back thinking, unbelievable what God has done. Now we have some sight, but for a very long time, there wasn't any sight, or it was negative on the sight. Do you understand what I'm saying? Christians live in this world. We live in a world of confident expectation, a world of hope. This is how it's going to... Look, I confidently expect when I die to go to heaven. I'm guessing that everybody in here would have the same confident expectation. I have never seen heaven. I have never talked with anybody who's been there. I've never had any messages left, you know, that came back, you know, hey, I'm here and it's all great. I've never had any of that. But I am dead sure that that's what's going to happen to me. Yes. I have confident expectation. Why? Because that's what God said. And so my life is a life of hope, confident expectation. The Christian life, much of it is that. Confident expectation. And you know what? The word in front of that, what's the word that Paul uses in front of it to describe this? Patience. Why? Because it's going to take a little time before that hope turns to sight. Before you see that confident expectation. It takes a lot of patience to pray for something more than two or three days without seeing any results. We live, the Christian life is a life of hope, confident expectation. We live there without the sight, but we never live in despair. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. 
Number four, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, Paul is stating here that he knows that they are truly saved. And he's going to go on to tell them why he knows that in the following verses. And that this was, he knows that this was a true work of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's all agree to this. How many of have seen things that seem like a work of the Spirit that did not end up being a work of the Spirit? Have you not seen that? You're like, oh yeah, this is an, oh no, that was not a work of the Spirit at all. Paul's saying, I know for sure that this is a work of the Spirit. And he's going to explain that. And we'll talk about that next week. But let's quickly address what they call the elephant in the room. Because a verse like this gives a crowd like this one of two reactions. You see that key word in there, and when, if you're a, of a particular doctrinal persuasion, you see that word, you're ready to wax eloquent for the next six weeks on that one word. If you're of the opposite persuasion, you see that word and you want to just go to the next verse without thinking about it. Okay, so it's the elephant in the room. Let's talk about it very quickly here. I do not like controversy. I especially do not like controversy that divides people for no purpose. And this is one of those areas that divides people for no purpose. If you look down through history, you are going to find that very good men were on both sides of this issue. And men who spoke, could read Greek and Hebrew better than I can speak English. And they have debated this issue for a long, long time. And guess what conclusion they come to? No conclusion. They cannot agree. Now, what does that tell me? That tells me two things. One, if those guys can't come to a conclusion on this, then, uh, then we're not going to come to a conclusion on this. And finally, we're going to be the ones who find the answer that solves this whole mystery. When people who, that's all they have done is study this, haven't come to a, God, good people have not come to an issue, a conclusion on this, we're not going to. So the debating on it is actually superfluous, and it brings nothing. The other thing it tells me is, God meant for this to be slightly mysterious. Now, it boils down to two thoughts. The two thoughts are this, that God chose everybody to either go to heaven or to hell, and we have no say in the matter. And the other thought is, you can choose to get saved whenever you want. Those are the two real thoughts in this. And neither of those thoughts are scriptural. To say that you can get saved without the Spirit of God drawing you and teaching you is to deny very clear Scripture. There is the Spirit of God must draw you or, you, or you're not just going to get saved whenever you want. Okay? And so to deny that and just say you get it saved whenever, is, is ridiculous. The ones who believe that God chose everyone are trying to define the mind of God and they come up with reasonings, if you've ever read them, and they're very bold about them, but they come up with reasonings that disagree with very clear pieces of Scripture. How can that be the truth? It comes from trying to reason with God's mind. He makes a statement, and then we try to reason from it. That's always dangerous. I'm trying to think about how to illustrate this, and this popped into my mind. This is a really weird illustration, but... When we were on vacation, they scheduled a shore excursion to swim with the dolphins. And you should have seen mom swimming with the dolphins. <laughs> and I think they got pictured, I think, someplace. Anyway, one of the things they had the dolphin do was come out of the water and kiss each one of us on the cheek. Now, I want you to think about this. If I think about this dolphin kissing me, and I think, this dolphin must love me, because it kissed me. And therefore, 
wow, that's, that's a pretty significant thing for this animal to come out of the water and kiss me on the cheek. And so, you know, I probably ought to move to Cosmel, where this dolphin lives, so that we can spend some more time together. And uh, you know, this is, do you, you see, because he kissed, it, he kissed me, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> she kissed me. <laughs> Cut the live stream, we're going home. <laughs> That was chapter number three, verse number one. <laughs> Do you understand? If I think that I'm putting thoughts in that dolphin's head, what do you think that dolphin is actually thinking? <laughs> That's exactly. For some reason, if I stick my snout up there and touch that guy's face, I get a fish for that. That's what the dolphin's thinking. But what I'm trying to tell you is when we start trying to think, I don't know what that dolphin thinks about this whole thing, what all that means. And if I start trying to think about what the dolphin's thinking, and it's trying to think about what I'm thinking, we're on two separate planes, and guess what? We can get really messed up here. And that's a weird illustration to kind of help us say, look, when you start trying to determine what God, after God says this, and then you try to reason from that, you can get a long ways off of the pier. So be super careful about that. And this is one of the big problems that we have. The reality is, both sides of this thing are, there's truth to it, and I don't know what it is. I don't know how to think like God. I don't know how to put all this together. I don't have to. What I do know is God said, whosoever will may come. Okay, what it looks like on his side of the equation, I don't have to know that. All I have to know is whosoever will may come. And the Spirit of God does his work, and we're going to see how this works next week, what the Spirit of God is doing. But I can live, and it doesn't affect me at all. I can do exactly what the Scripture says. There's a balance in here someplace. Obviously, God meant it to be slightly mysterious because good men have not been able to wrangle this out like all most of the other doctrines this one doesn't come to that. So we don't have to. We just go with the clear teaching of the scripture and we give the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Whosoever will may come. And so I don't shy away from this, but I don't like controversy for no reason. I cannot explain the mind of God. There is something to it, but that's God's business and I don't understand it. I'm satisfied to know that the Spirit of God does his work, and I give the gospel, and the Spirit does his work on that in the hearts of men. That's my thought on that, and next week we'll look at how Paul knew that this was a work of the Spirit, which I think is more important than that particular topic. But we're done here tonight. Thoughts, questions, comments? Yes, ma'am? Chris and I have done some conversations about that. <laughs> well, yeah. I will... Correct. There's a lot of difficulties in that, and so these are trigger words, and they use them. The one that they use a lot is Romans 8.29, and that's an obvious, what it's saying is you're conformed, he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so you just can't pull out the word predestined and say, well, that's, but, it's, but to say that there's nothing to it would be to, de to deny other pieces of scripture that God has not made clear to us. There is one passage in the
predestination is exactly what it sounds like, predestination. What does he mean? Well, in Romans 8, 29, what he means is when you get saved, he is going to, the destination is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so that one is clear. I'm not saying it is all clear, and that's why there's debate over, that's why men have struggled over this for centuries. And if you listen to Spurgeon, he's funny because he preaches on both sides of this. Without, any, without ever trying to reconcile the two, he preaches on both sides of this thing. And I think that's probably the most accurate way to to handle it. But we just leave it alone because it doesn't, at the end of the day, if you knew, what difference would it make to you? And so, anyway, that's... All right, thanks for being here tonight. We have a prayer bulletin. Um, keep praying for Callie. There's a million different pieces to that puzzle of her getting her surgery on her jaw. It needs to take place in a reasonable time frame, and there's just so many pieces of this puzzle that just pray that the Lord will work it out, because humanly speaking, it just, there's just no way that all that it could take place. Uh, appreciate you praying um, for the DeWine's grandson. Um, he is out of the hospital. He's eating and gaining weight and all of that, and so keep praying, but thank you so much. Uh, he is making progress. Keep praying for Marilyn. Uh, she's in that therapy facility at this moment. And I haven't heard, Gene Smith said he was up there, but she was a little, there was, it was a limited time frame as when she, people could come because she's got so much therapy going on. And so has anybody else talked to her about that? Yes, you make sure, definitely check before you go, because Gene Smith said he got there, and she said that's the perfect time, because it was just a real small window for them to, because she had so many things. That I'm guessing they're trying to, if she's not going to get bedridden for the rest of her life, I'm guessing they're trying to keep her moving here and getting her, that's it's a lot of, to, to, to keep going. And Where so, just slipped my mind. Where is she? Um, Ankin. Uh, living his, near Living History Farms. And if you're watching Marilyn, we care for you and we're praying for you. She watches the live stream. I think she got the nurses to get the live stream going for her last week. And so, Anything else need to... Uh, let's see. The missionaries uh, on the back. Uh, the, Indi the Let's see. I better be careful here. Some of these are... Uh, well, I'll let you read through them. There's nothing in here that's... That's, uh, that's super important that I mention um, publicly. Although the Dobbs, uh, I won't mention where they're at. I think it's interesting, the church, we sent them money, but that will be the first actual building uh, that has ever been in the history of that country that is a, a Baptist uh, college seminary. Uh, the, f the first one ever in a country. That's in the history of the world, that's a, that's a pretty significant thing to have. And so uh, we've invested in that twice now. And so I appreciate that. Other prayer requests tonight? Yes, sir. Yeah, I work with. He's had Jason. Pray for Jason. How old is he? Uh, early 50s. Thanks. That's young. Does he have a family, I assume? Pray for that man. Um, pray for his salvation as well as his healing. Yes, sir. Pastor, if we could remember uh, a very dear friend in Kentucky. Uh, she's, she's saved. She's faithful in her church. She's faithful in Christ. She will go on Facebook and she will give the gospel out to people. You know, they come to Christ before it's too late. She has a son. She's already lost one son to drugs. She has another son that is falling back into that equipment. The same one. The same one. Thank you. 
is her name? First name? His name is Nick. Nick. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we will break up for prayer. If you are able to stay with us, that'd be great. Um, they are having, they've got cake downstairs, is that right? Cake downstairs. It's Anna's birthday. Is it today or tomorrow is Anna's birthday? And so if you guys would like to go down, they're going to have some cake downstairs. Love for you to, to join down there just for a few minutes if you can do that. Uh, they'd appreciate that. And so go down there and get a piece of cake. Raise your, either way is fine, yes. And so thank you for being here tonight. Walk with the Lord. And if you can stay with us to pray that.